website. We have a training session on it. And the LSRPA has been helping out the department in putting them on, taking care of registration. And uh, we have a boatload of speakers for you today. Uh, and we have, I guess, three topics to talk about, clean fill, alternative fill, and historic fill. And we're all filled up. So that's appropriate. Forgive me. On the uh, alternate fill and clean fill side, we have uh, Terry Sugihara, Dave Barsky, Kathy Coons, and Roger Ferguson. From He's the outsider on the group. He is from Sadat Associates. And uh, on the historic fill side, we have Kevin Schick today, Marianne Cusirk, telling you a little bit about how groundwater and historic fill go together somehow. And Kathy Stetzer, she's the outsider on that group. She's from Rue Associates. Uh, and these people have been involved in writing the, the guidance documents. So these people are the ones who you want to listen to uh, about these topics. Uh, just to uh, tell you a little bit about LSRPA, we're in an organization supporting the department in creating guidance documents. We're very heavily involved in, in helping the department and, and trying to help them have this new program, which is already uh, a couple of years old. Um, but I think we're all feeling it's still new and we're still trying to get our feet wet. And uh, the LSRPA has been helping out and uh, functioning on all levels. And uh, the LSRPA gets its support from sponsors that, uh, that uh, support us. Uh, so I'd like to recognize them. Joe, next slide. Uh, here they are, Accutest Labs, AWT Environmental, Borba Surveying, East Coast Drilling, EST Remediation Contractors, Hampton Clark Veritech Labs, and Riker Danzig Attorneys at Law. Thanks to those sponsors, they're responsible for bringing in the coffee and the soda and the pretzels and the chips, and we even have Halloween candy today. So don't grab it and give it to the kids. It's for you, okay? Um, next slide, Joe. Okay. Um, I just want to bring you up to speed on where we are with all the guidance documents. There are 16 of them, uh, and six have been finalized, including today's uh, fill guidance. So that's on the left side. Um, and all the other ones still need to be finalized and are still being worked on. Next slide, Joe. Uh, and for every guidance document and every major issue in the site remediation program, the LSRPA has people involved and DEP has people involved in uh, on, on several committees and um, uh, each one of these categories is addressed by a lot of people. And uh, next slide. And here's what we're facing right now. Here's a little LSRP down at the bottom scratching his head. And uh, we have a lot in front of us to learn. We're still learning. We're in, in the process of learning. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. Next one. Uh, just to give you an, uh, uh, a heads up on our training schedule, uh, please realize that these dates are tentative, except for the first one that you see. We conducted a uh, seminar at Rutgers in August, and it was very successful. It was a practical applications class where it wasn't just a lecture. It was more or less a... Uh, uh, an involvement with groups and we asked questions and they responded and the groups worked together and we solved, we solved problems and, and brought cases through the site remediation process right in the class. Very successful. In fact, uh, it was so successful that we were asked to put it on again. So on November 30th, uh, the class will be held again. I, I don't know if there's, it's full now, okay. Okay, so there's another one scheduled in February sometime. We'll let you know when that is. Uh, and here are the other guidance documents and training sessions to go along with them coming up. Okay, next one. News for LSRPs. How many are LSRPs in here? Okay, quite a few. 
Um, there's an exam coming. You probably all know that. Just to bring you uh, up to date on that, vendor has been hired. And the first exam, the vendor says, will be available in the spring. It's not quite defined as to what the date will be when the first exam is given. We don't know um, how it's going to work out with the regulations being finalized and, and that sort of thing. And the timing of it is is a little bit unknown now, but it's coming. And if you want to find out what the state board is doing, we have a state LSRP board established now. You can go on the state board website and get some information on what the state board has been doing for a while. Uh, they're writing regulations and they're going to regulate the LSRPs as far as their code of conduct. Continuing ed requirements, there's, I th I'm pretty sure there's going to be about 36 credit hours required for the LSRPs for every three-year renewal cycle that we have. Um, and it also, uh, they're, they're also worrying about and, and regulating the LSRP audit process and, and complaints against LSRPs also. Why join LSRPA? A lot of reasons. Uh, I hope you join. Uh, it's only 150 bucks, and uh, it's well worth it uh, to, to join and get involved. And I know that the way I learn things is to be involved with the LSRPA and, and being involved with the training sessions and, and uh, all that sort of thing. And I encourage you to do the same. Next and last slide. Here's how you become a member. Just go on the website or there is a form available if you'd like to fill out a form. But uh, I'll be around. Just ask me. I'll let you know how to, how to join up. And thank you very much. Enjoy the session. Thank you, Dan. Hey, Joe, how many people do we have on the webinar? 141 people on the webinar, too. Hello to you guys out there. Um, one of the first things I want to say before we go any further is that there are some differences between what was posted, the slides that were posted uh, as handouts yesterday and what you'll see today. And your packets are missing one presentation, which we have copies of. And um, right after I'm done, I'll uh, go through and, and hand them out so that you can add them to your packets. Um, everybody who works on this stuff has an, a, another job, so we're all crazed and busy and running around, and it's amazing we don't make even more errors than we do. Uh, but I want to welcome everyone. It's great attendance today. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, this is simply a graphic to show how important rules and tech guidance are. They're going to work together, and they form the basis of the program. It's important that you know what's in the rules, and it's very important like you're here today and then you get a, a good understanding of what is in the guidance as well. Next. There were, guidance, as Dan was saying, there are many guidance uh, committees and they're composed of DEP and external uh, stakeholders who work long and hard and many hours uh, to come to consensus. It doesn't mean that any every person that was on that committee got their way or only represents their point of view and wanted that in the document. It re represents each of the documents that comes out as a final is a, is a good consensus on the topic, therefore making it more usable and, um, and more fair all, all around. The committees looked and worked with closely with the tech rule people who were removing a lot of detail from the rules. They had to figure what was coming out so they knew what to put into the guidance documents. And the, because the rules are becoming much less prescriptive and really looking at big milestones, it's important that the tech guidance has the kind of uh, detail that people will need in order to apply um, these things to their sites. And each of the committees has been so gracious in uh, developing training uh, on each of these topics. They are your topic experts. They will be here um, after the training is done. And you can call them, email them, tackle them in the parking lot. No, hopefully not tackle. Anyway, so they're here for you uh, and tomorrow and the next day. Um, so that's the kind of support we intend to keep providing. Next. 
Okay, the, why the stakeholder process? Why their input? Well, Sarah's told us, Sarah told us to. We had to. But it was really important, and it was a really good thing. Uh, I was not actually a believer in the beginning, um, but at the end of the process, I really am a believer. All the, all the things and the, the documents and the rules and everything that has had stakeholder input is much better for that. Next. As you've seen over and over again, rules contain the what must be accomplished. It includes performance objectives and time frames and standards. And the guidance is how to. Uh, how to meet the regulatory time frames and um, use scientifically technical uh, approaches. And uh, if you follow those procedures, you're pretty sure that you're heading in the right direction um, for any particular site. Next. Variances from re regulation. If any of you ever go to the SRAG meetings or the steering committee meetings, this comes up every single time, talking about variance from regulation as opposed to deviation from guidance. So the next two slides are on that topic, and then I'm done, almost. Uh, variance from regulation is covered in the tech rules under 1.7. A, and it says what you can vary from, what you can't vary from, what you have to submit to support your decision to vary from the rules. In the rules right now, that include, it says regulations and guidance. But during this whole process, a stakeholder process, there was a lot of concern that we should be more flexible with how we allow people to deviate from guidance. So a, um, go to the next slide. So in a, shortly a position paper or little guidance paper will be put up on the web page um, explaining a little bit more detail about what, what we're doing right now as far as deviation from guidance and uh, how we're going to deal with this in the future. Um, we want people to use their common sense. We know that everything we put in rules and guidance can't apply, can't really address every single situation at every single site. So we anticipate people using their professional judgment and varying in a way that will make the remediation protective of uh, human health and the environment. Next. You've seen this all. We're, we're getting there one at a time. Uh, getting these things posted. Uh, we're going to hold questions to the end of each segment. So we're going to do clean alternative and clean fill first. You can ask them questions and then we'll have a very short break. Then we'll come back and then you can hold your questions to the end of historic fill and DAP presentation. And I think that's about it. Okay, Terry Sugihara, it was the team leader for um, clean alternative and clean fill. You have to say them in the right order. Right? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Terry Sugihara. I'm a section chief in the Bureau of Environmental Evaluation and Risk Assessment in the Site Remediation Program. I'll be the first of four committee members presenting on the topic of alternative and clean fill guidance for site remediation program sites. Please note that the title of the presentation differs slightly from the title of what's on the uh, online guidance. We are anticipating making this change to emphasize that this guidance is with both alternative as well as clean fill. And in the same uh, token, respond to some requests for clarity from some of the guidance users that we've received. Please also note that the words for SRP sites has been specifically put in the title. This is because the guidance applies only to sites undergoing remediation. This is a fact that has been, let's say, continued to be overlooked. We get a lot of questions on it. Uh, so we have included as a recurring theme through all the presentations uh, as a reminder to our users that this is the case. Hey, it works. This is the uh, committee. Uh, you'll be hearing from the first four names uh, on this list. Um, 
I would be remiss in not acknowledging, and I don't know if any of them are here, uh, the participation of Carrie McGowan, Kathleen Murray, and Neil Rivers. Um, uh, Roger Ferguson also is an external stakeholder, as Tessie mentioned. And uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I uh, had my suspicions about the process, but their contribution and their hard work over the past year has really been invaluable. Uh, I would say that the document is far better uh, for their participation. Although, don't tell Roger that I said something nice because he gets very difficult to deal with. As Tessie said, we have a, a consensus document. Uh, I think there, in any event, there is a hundred percent or unanimous agreement that of the possible ways we could have gone, we have selected the optimal approach to dealing with Phil. Okay, what you're going to hear today, uh, I'm going to be doing a little bit of an introduction. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about the history of the guidance, some of the transitions that are going to occur, as well as goals and uh, some of the principles that underlie uh, the development of this guidance. Uh, Kathy Kuntz will be following with a discussion on alternative fill. Dave Barsky will be addressing uh, the clean fill topics, and Roger Ferguson will be discussing compliance, compliance options, and I believe using some case examples to kind of tie this all together. As, Kathy, um, as Tessie said, uh, we are, we'll have a question and answer session at the end, and we're requesting that you hold your questions till that time. I would also say that we, we, based on the input that we've received, we appreciate that some of you have very, very specific, very unique questions that you need answers, and we intend to provide that to you. However, we'd like to do it after the presentation because at this point we're trying to basically get out a general knowledge uh, to the used, potential users of the document and not really get into the nuances that, uh, that are based on what you can or can't do or what you desire to do on your particular site. So we appreciate your cooperation uh, in this matter. History. I think we've all had the experience of driving down the turnpike or whatever major highway there is in New Jersey and suddenly seeing a large pile of soil that wasn't there the day before. Sometimes these piles go away. They may be associated with DOT road construction. They may be associated with other types of construction. Sometimes you just don't know. Um, unfortunately, uh, we find that some of these piles, stockpiles, do not go away. They increase in size. This represents a concern um, to the department because they are as such, because of the unknown nature and the large size, represent potential future remediations that the department may have to undertake uh, despite having limited resources to deal with this particular problem. Uh, we noticed uh, in the period between 2000 and 2005 an increasing number uh, of these stockpiles. Uh, subsequent investigation uh, showed that many were actually operating as unpermitted landfills, and it was for a variety of reasons. Um, these, this class of site, and, and I, I realize I'm taking some liberties with the terminology, uh, I've been referring to, to them as de facto landfills, and I apologize in advance to our brethren in, in solid waste about this, but when you hear me talk about de facto landfills, this is the situation that I'm referring to. A parallel problem also exists in that the department was not very good in providing information to its own personnel on how to integrate you know, as a part of the regular remedial process the use of contaminated material. We were great at capping, we were great at moving, but pretty much uh, we didn't really try and find a use for the material. It was basically a problem that we were trying to deal with to get rid of it. In order to resolve these two issues, in uh, June of 2008, the department issued some guidance, and it's entitled Guidance for Beneficial Use of Soil and Non-Soil Material in the Remediation of Contaminated Sites and the Closure of Solid Waste Landfills. This was obviously implemented in 2008, and then through its use, there were certain areas or aspects that were identified that needed refinement. They needed to be fixed, if you will. Uh, those revisions were developed. Uh, 
However, uh, this also ran into a department desire to incorporate this, these, these, the generation of this new guidance uh, as part of the stakeholder process, uh, and in particular, that the guidance should be adapted for independent LSRP use rather than rely on the original uh, focus, which was department approval, to move forward on these projects. And that was the, one of the most important changes that we had to basically switch this 2008 guidance uh, to the new way of doing business. The guidance evolved from this point. It was finalized in August of 2011 and uh, hit the website in, and in September of 2011. So now we have guidance. As it stands, it reflects the existing tech rules. Uh, it provides guidance for LSRPs to use, so we are basically consistent with the intent of the Site Remediation Reform Act. Unfortunately, you all know that the technical rules are being readopted. There's going to be changes. Our intent at this point is to reflect those changes, whatever they are, uh, in May of 2012, which is the expected adoption date of the new tech requirements. We will be coming out with a new version. Uh, we're hoping that, for the most part, we are looking at citation changes, edits, things that we missed uh, in the previous version. We are not anticipating major refinements of the guidance. But we are acknowledging that this will be occurring, hopefully in the vicinity, or hopefully post-May 2012. Goals and, and maybe a better term uh, that should be used here is considerations. The department wants to enhance possible ways to use contaminated materials in part to decrease the flow of material to unauthorized operations. But there are limitations uh, to this. The department under SRP cannot regulate fill outside of remedial activities because it does not have the authority to do so. This is even more true for clean fill uh, when it's used in a non-remedial action situation. Essentially, the department would be trying to regulate a retail product which has no regulatory concern, clearly out of our purview and certainly not one of our strengths. Our intention is to stay away from this aspect, although I recognize in the audience there's a desire to have us weighed in on this particular topic. For now, we are staying away. Second issue, avoid de facto landfilling. It's pretty much self-evident. We've touched on it a little bit already, um, but I think I need to add a clarification. The department is not opposed to landfilling. It merely asks that the landfilling be done in, in a way consistent with its existing relevant regulations. Alternatives to clean fill. Historically, filling has, uh, in many instances, been using clean fill uh, as uh, clean material as the fill, sorry. Guidance on alternative fill is being offered to expand its use as an economical substitute for clean fill and to do so in a manner that's protective of human health and the environment. Again, we are trying to redirect the flow of materials from these de facto landfills. But simultaneously, we are trying to decrease the need for enforcement actions as well as conserve landfill capacity uh, as parallel benefits to these actions. Kathy's going to be addressing this more uh, and I'm basically going to leave the rest of the information for her to explain. Finally, clean fill. I will admit, in my opinion, that the department has not done a very good job uh, explaining or defining clean fill to date. We're hoping to remedy this in the proposed technical rules. Uh, and certainly this was not addressed in the 2008 guidance. We're trying to do this now in the current guidance. In particular, this will mean uh, that we have to define what clean fill is in a clear and concise manner and that we will uh, also communicate what is the appropriate way to determine if a material qualifies as clean fill. Again, this is the topic that Dave Barsky will be dealing with and I'm going to leave it to him to, to carry on the discussion further. The main challenge facing the community could be stated as, how do you do all these things without making the situation worse? It's a complex process. There's lots of people involved. 
Uh, it's a very torturous path that you have to weave. Uh, this has also been coupled with a desire not to radically alter the remedial investigation process or to change the initially selected remedial actions because of the use of alternative film. The committee concluded that the best way to do this was to proceed, the best way to proceed was to retain the area of concern based approach of the remedial investigation process to the greatest extent possible. As a result, the, depart, the committee adopted three default positions, first being like on like. The intention is to allow the same contaminants that are already present in an area of concern to be imported or placed in that area. AOCs are largely defined by their, um, the identified contaminants, uh, and this would seem to be a, a no-brainer. Unfortunately, this has a very significant side effect, if you will. If it's not present, you can't bring it in seemingly a minor issue. The problem is clean areas and areas that have been remediated to below regulatory concern by definition do not have contaminants present. You cannot bring in contaminated material to these areas. This certainly is a significant effect of this like-on-like -like rule. So we've answered in part the question of what uh, but there's also another aspect of it. The critical issue is what is the nature of the material you're bringing? What is actually the concentration that you're going to be allowed to, be, to bring in? I will say of all the topics that the committee dealt with, this proved to be the most vexing. We spent a lot of time trying to figure this out and uh, going around in a circular way was probably the, the standard MO of what we were doing. The um, as I said before, the committee did not want to disrupt the uh, existing remedial process. What was decided was to use a conservative compliance metric to determine the concentration allowed to be brought in. Having a buffer associated with the compliance metric meant there would be less need to increase the amount of data to confirm the nature of the imported material and the site were not being made worse. It would also allow site-specific variations or options to be put in place. Essentially, the committee made a decision for a trade-off. We would allow, we'd be more restrictive on what came into a site, but by the same token, we would decrease the sampling requirements and the options of what you could do on the site. The committee selected for us, as a starting default, the 75th percentile uh, of the contaminant population. This is in part because it is a statistically simple approach uh, yet it is relatively robust. And Roger will be carrying on this conversation uh, to a much greater extent in a little bit. The final question then is how much? It was observed that potential difficulties, when they occurred, seemed to be inherently associated with large volumes. The larger the volume, the more issues you had uh, potentially associated with a, a given site. The determination was, plate, was made to place limits on the volumes that will allow, be allowed to be imported. Um, this particular volume would be the amount required to perform the remediation. The additional benefit of doing this is that the, there was an expectation that this would enhance the probability of a remediation being committed, c completed quickly. Thanks, Jim. How to do it right. The committee desired uh, that the guidance be sufficiently informative for those that were unfamiliar with the topic to permit the remedial process to move forward without delay and without consultation with the department. The intent was not to be prescriptive, although I'm sure that some of you will find it prescriptive. We are basically trying to help people who don't know about this particular topic to get through this process with a minimum of assistance. We are trying to achieve a balance uh, in the audience, in, in the audience that we're dealing with. Clearly, if you know everything about there is about to, about fill guidance, anything I say is prescriptive. If you know nothing, everything is helpful. 
this is all perception issue. We're hoping that you'll understand that we are trying to reach out to a broad audience and that while you may in particular think it's prescriptive or informative, it might not be shared by one of your colleagues sitting next to you. Finally, oh, sorry, um, professional judgment. Another common word that we've been talking about a lot with the LSRP process. Um, the original guidance was changed to allow the incorporation of significant amounts of professional judgment into this process. We identify default positions and allow for deviation or variance depending on whether it's the uh, tech rule or the guidance uh, from these starting positions. And again, we're expecting some sort of justification for this. Um, examples that we're going to be uh, coming up in the, in the f uh, future talks are sampling options and Kathy and Dave will be talking about them in connection with alternative fill and clean fill. Roger will be discussing uh, compliance options. Again, another uh, indication that we're trying to insert into this process professional judgment. Finally, responsibility. And I know this is a bit of a bugaboo for um, the LSRPs. The investigator, which is typically the LSRP of record or could be done department personnel, will be acting as a, what we call the gatekeeper for the site. The concept of the gatekeeper is that the gatekeeper is in control of the site and determines what happens on the site. Uh, this is particularly relevant for the placement of fill material. In all seriousness, I have to ask the question of you. How is it not appropriate that the gatekeeper be held responsible for what happens on the site? And in addition, be able to explain why certain actions were taken on the site. I really do not think that this is an unreasonable position and it will be the position we maintain. At this point, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Kathy Kunz, who will be talking to you about alternative film. Hello, everybody. I'm Kathy Kunz, and I work in the Site Remediation Program in the Bureau of Environmental Evaluation and Risk Assessment, where I'm a technical coordinator. I'm going to talk to you today about the alternative fill portion of our guidance, and I'd like to start off with the definition of alternative fill. Alternative fill is defined in our guidance as material that exceeds, that contains contaminants in excess of our soil remediation standards. That includes site-specific alternative standards, site-specific interim standards, and it also includes impact to groundwater standards, which I'll discuss a little bit more later. Alternative fill can also be material that contains contaminants like asbestos, radiation, hex chrome, or dioxin that do not currently have standards, but they are in excess of our current criterion or action levels. Alternative fill does not contain free liquid or product, and it can be a soil or a non-soil. Uh, soil would include sediments, uh, dredge materials, and processed dredge materials. Non-soil is any material that's not soil, and that would include things like recycled concrete. The purpose of this portion of the guidance is to show the investigator how to use alternative fill at an SRP site in a protective manner, at, at alternative fight site AOCs, like to be specific. And I'd like to see, say that it's important to note that an AOC is defined by contaminant levels and, and distribution. It's not an arbitrary designation, and that an AOC may include the entire site. The guidance provides details on sampling frequencies for fill characterization and describes compliance with the requirements in the proposed technical rule. Again, just to be clear, those requirements, which are the basis for our entire document, are the like-on-like -like requirement and the 75th percentile. Like-on-like -like says that you cannot bring a contaminant onto your receiving site that's not already there. 75th percentile says that you can't bring a contaminant. The maximum value of the contaminant that you're bringing on cannot exceed the 75th percentile of that same contaminant that's already at your receiving site. You cannot make the receiving site worse. Alternative fill can be from off-site or on-site sources or donors. Off-site donors can be SRP sites or non-SRP sites. They also may be in-state or out-of-state. On-site material refers simply to material that's moved around from one AOC to another at the site that you're remediating. We talk about them separately in the guidance. The requirements are slightly different. I'd like to talk about 
the off-site sources first, and that's detailed in Section 4 of our guidance. When you want to use alternative fill as part of your remediation, you need to make sure that the soils are fully delineated at the receiving site according to the tech rules and applicable guidance. The data must then be evaluated so that you understand the contaminants of concern present and their corresponding concentrations. You'll then need to organize your data so that you can do the like-on-like -like and the 75th percentile comparison with, with the donor site. There is an exception to the like-on-like -like requirement for this guidance only and for PAHs only, and that says that you may group PAHs that share the same health-based criterion, and an example of that, an easy example of that would be benzoate pyrene, which has a health-based criterion of 0.66 parts per million. Uh, so does dibenz AH anthracene have the same health-based criterion? You may group those together, uh, meaning you may add them together to perform the 75th calculation at the receiving site and the maximum calculation at your donor site. I'll talk a little bit more about that, and so will Roger. You may not do this grouping of PAHs for non-carcinogenic PAHs because they each have a different health endpoint. Next, you'll need to determine the 75th percentile value for each of your contaminants of concern. That's an easy calculation. It's delineated in Appendix A of our fill guidance. Or you may use another compliance option uh, if you choose, and that would be a variance from our guidance. Roger will discuss other compliance options in his presentation as well. So you're going to end up with a spreadsheet listing each, car, each contaminant of concern with its corresponding 75th percentile listed next to it so that when you do the same evaluation for your donor site, it will be a straight comparison. Next, you'll need to characterize your donor site. The investigator must have a thorough understanding of the proposed fill material as to uniformity, what contaminants of concern are present, and their concentrations that are present in the fill, proposed fill. So that, again, you can comply with the like-on-like -like and the 75th percentile requirements. To do that, the investigator would conduct a site review, which is very similar to a preliminary assessment. And uh, through that site review, you'd evaluate existing data or other available information to determine data gaps and subsequent sampling needs for characterization of the proposed fill. The investigator may use some or all of the existing data and or collect new discrete data as per Table 1 of our guidance. Um, the Table 1 sampling frequencies, I'm not going to show you a slide of Table 1, but it is in our guidance, and they give, our, our table gives a default value, which is the value that you would use for sampling frequencies if you know nothing about your donor material. We also have a reduced um, sampling frequency column, and that would be if you have existing data or other information that would lead you to believe that you have partial characterization of that material. You can come further off that number based on entirely on your professional judgment. So there's a lot of flexibility built into Table 1. It depends on professional judgment and what you are able to find out about your donor fill material or what you know already. If an investigator wants to consider using existing data to characterize his donor site, that's fine if the following four conditions are met. If a New Jersey certified lab performed the analysis, if the data meets our QAQC requirements, if acceptable uh, collection methods were used, sample collection methods, and if the alternative fill was not moved once it was characterized at your site. Although existing discrete data is strongly preferred, if there is existing composite data that the investigator may determine if it's usable, again, based entirely on their professional judgment, if it is reliable and representative. And if it is, you can then use that composite data to reduce the number of discrete samples that we recommend in Table 1. Of course, composites are not acceptable for volatile organic contamination as per our field sampling procedures manual. And if you do use composite data, you should know that that's a variance requiring a justification. Uh, composite data would be especially useful to consider for dredge materials from ODST, our Office of Dredging and Sediment Technology, or to re reduce the discrete number, the number of discrete samples you'll need for an excessively large amount of fill material with larger than 10,000 cubic yards. When the investigator determines that new data is needed in order to help characterize the donor site, they need to develop a sampling strategy based on what they've learned from the site review. Sampling frequencies given in Table 1, again, may be modified based on the level of knowledge you've attained through your site review. 
the more you know about the donor fill, the fewer samples that you need to take in order to complement that data. In general, analyses for the new data for a donor site would be for target compound list organics and target analyte list inorganics. It also would include the plus 30 and EPH, which is not on the slide. But those analytes, again, may be modified based on what you know and what you've uh, learned about the fill material. So you could add an analyte to that list. Say you have a excessive uh, total, a total chrome level that's excessive, then you would, might want to go back and do a hex chrome analysis. Or if you have data, a series of data sampling events that show that volatiles or some other uh, parameter was not a concern, you may eliminate that with justification. Once you've characterized your donor site with the new and or existing data, you need to organize all your data in order to perform the like-on-like -like in the 75th percentile evaluation. So you'll organize the data on an Excel spreadsheet with each contaminant of concern listed. You'll group the PAHs according to their toxicity values if, if you need to or want to. And then you'll compare the maximum value you have for each of the contaminants of concern at your donor site to the 75th percentile value that you've already calculated on your spreadsheet for the contaminant, same contaminant present at your receiving site. If you meet both the 75th and like-on-like -like requirements, you can use it as fill, and if you don't, you can't. Roger will uh, illustrate the spreadsheet in, uh, in his example, and you'll see how to group the PAHs. Uh, you must evaluate the fill's potential to contaminate groundwater prior to placement, prior to bringing it on your receiving site. And you do that with a, a very straightforward impact of groundwater evaluation. If contaminant levels in your donor material fall below the default impact of groundwater screening levels or AOC-specific screening levels at the receiving site, then no further impact of groundwater evaluation is needed. But if your contaminant levels in the donor material are above those screening levels, you'll need to run SPLP samples as per our impact of groundwater guidance, which is on the web. If you pass the SPLP data, you may use it as fill. If you don't pass the SPLP analysis, then you cannot use it as fill unless the placement of that material will not affect the groundwater remedy or surface water that's on site or adjacent to the site. I'd like you to note that uh, if you exceed the default levels for metals with the secondary standards, such as aluminum, silver, or manganese, or anything with the secondary standard, you do not have to go ahead with this SPLP analysis. Uh, it can be used as alternative fill unless that material is believed to have resulted from a discharge. I'd also like to point out that this IGW section is slightly different from what you'll see posted in our fill guidance in section 4.6, and that's because, which called for additional sampling of material to be placed near or below the water table. Um, further evaluation of that concern showed that these additional steps are not needed, and our reposting of the document with its new name will reflect this change. There are specific requirements for other materials that you may consider for alternative fill from off-site, and I'd like to just briefly review those. Uh, if sediments are what you're considering as your alternative fill, uh, you'd be talking about processed dredge material and dredge material, and it's evaluated the same way as other potential fill sources. Uh, the concern with dredge material is the additives that may be a source of contamination. Uh, data from the Office of Dredging and Sediment Technology, our ODST office, may be acceptable for use in our alternative fill evaluation in part or in its entirety. Uh, sediments must have an acceptable use determination from ODST in order to use them as alternative fill. The receiving site SRP doesn't need an AUD, but the ODST, the Office of Dredging and Sediment Technology, does require a final remedial action work plan. For historic fill that is non-soil, for instance, recycled concrete, a Certificate of Authority to Operate and Beneficial Use Determination, or CAO BUD, as you would commonly know it, uh, would be required from our Office of Solid Waste. The data would also need to be evaluated as per our Section 4.5 because you might require additional sampling in order to do it, fulfill our 75th percentile evaluation. And since historic fill guidance does not require an impact to groundwater evaluation, you would have to do that in order to use it as an alternative fill. So you'd have to follow that section of our guidance. If recycled concrete is what you would like to bring on as alternative fill, 
it is subject both to this guidance and the recycled concrete guidance from solid and hazardous waste program. And you will need a CAO bud for recycled concrete being brought on as fill. If you have concerns about impact to groundwater, then you'd have to do that evaluation as well. There are materials that are not acceptable for use as alternative fill or that have restrictions for their use, and they are listed here. PCB containing materials are restricted by TOSCA regulations plus the tech rules plus the site remediation standards. Asbestos, since there's no currently no DEP standard for asbestos, it is not acceptable for use as alternative fill. Repro waste is not acceptable since only non-hazardous waste may be used for fill at SRP sites. Also, no material with dioxin above our current action levels is acceptable for fill. Radiological material is similarly excluded if it has levels above natural background. Okay, that's it for off-site donors. I just want to talk to you a little bit in this last slide about on-site donors. And by that, I mean moving material from one AOC to another AOC at the site that you're remediating. You're going to evaluate your donor AOC and your receiving AOC, and contaminated fill may be, may, may be moved excuse me, from one AOC to another if it doesn't result in increased groundwater contamination and if it does not result in mixing of incompatible contaminants. We are relaxing the 75th and the like-on-like -like requirements for on-site movement if clean AOCs are created or enlarged, and token enlargement does not count. So less than 10% aerial enlargement is considered token. That would not get the exclusion. But placement or encroachment on clean AOCs is strictly prohibited still. Impact to groundwater would still need to be evaluated. You'd compare the groundwater data from both of the receiving and the donor AOCs, and ideally it should be similar. And if it's not, you'd have to go through an impact to groundwater evaluation as per Section 5 of our guidance. Historic fill at multiple contiguous brownfield sites accounts for another exception for on-site movement. And what that says is that on-site relocation of historic fill within the development but across property lines would be allowed if you're not increasing groundwater contamination, if you're remediating the historic fill according to the tech regs, and if you are protective of human health and the environment all other exclusions would still apply, all other exclusions and limitations for Section 4. That is the conclusion of the alternative fill portion of this guidance presentation. Thank you for your attention. I'd now like to introduce Dave Borsky to present the clean fill section. Thank you. Hello. I'm Dave Barsky. I have been a technical coordinator in the Bureau of Environmental Evaluation and Risk Assessment for over 25 years. I am presenting the clean fill portion of this training, which is found in section six of the guidance. Next slide, please. Clean fill is addressed currently in the technical rule at 6.4 B2 and 3. As shown in the slide, clean fill must be uncontaminated and the quality of the fill must be documented. However, there is no formal definition of clean fill in the technical rule at 1.8. There is no current guidance for determining what is clean fill. The department has always made this decision on what material is acceptable for use as clean fill, but with the advent of the LSRP program, there is a need for guidance so the LSRP can now make this decision. As you will see, the process for making this decision is similar to what Kathy just presented for alternative fill. Next slide. If you look at the photo, can you tell which pile maybe uses clean fill? No, but by following this new technical guidance, you should be able to make appropriate and consistent decisions. The purpose of the new technical guidance for clean fill is simple. It describes how to determine whether material is clean to ensure contaminated fill is not used as clean fill at SRP sites. It includes a definition of clean fill and provides the details needed on how to comply with the current and proposed technical rule requirements, which includes a fill use plan, uh, which is detailed in Appendix B of the guidance. Next slide. As with alternative fill, 
The guidance applies equally to material from on-site and off-site sources. Off-site sources can be from in-state and out-of-state sources. And as Terry stated earlier, this technical guidance applies to SRP sites only. Where professional judgment is used to deviate from the guidance, you include the appropriate justification for the deviation in the remedial action work plan and or the remedial action report. Next slide. The definition of clean field will be used in a remedial action has four components. One, it meets all soil remediation standards, site-specific alternative standards, or site-specific interim standards. This includes meeting impact to groundwater standards, which I will present later in the training. Two, it meets all criteria or action levels for contaminants without standards, such as asbestos, radiation, hexavalent chromium, and dioxins. Three, it does not contain extraneous debris or solid waste and does not contain free liquids, which includes free product. Four, it can be soil or non-soil, which have separate definitions in the guidance. Soil includes natural soils and sediments, which includes processed dredge material. Non-soil is any material that is not soil, such as recycled concrete. Next slide. To determine whether a proposed source of clean fill is clean, an investigator must have a thorough understanding of the donor site current and historical use and the types and concentrations of natural or man-made hazardous substances present in the donor material. To develop this understanding, a donor site review is conducted, which is similar to what is done when conducting a preliminary assessment. Analytical data is needed to assess hazardous substance concentrations in donor material. These data can come from existing data obtained during the site review and or from samples collected and analyzed using this technical guidance. Next slide. Existing data may be used. To assess existing analytical data from the site review, there are four conditions that allow for use of existing data as shown in the slide. These are already covered by Kathy, so I only focus on how you would actually use them. These four conditions are based on the need to understand the reliability of the existing data and the history of the donor material. Both of these two factors must be considered when evaluating the donor material. For example, reliable data is insufficient where the donor material has been moved since it was sampled. This could have resulted in contamination of the donor material. In this case, sampling and analyses using this technical guidance would be needed before deciding whether to use the donor material as clean fill. Next slide. Existing composite data may be able to be used. Composite sample data, including data from the Department's Office of Dredging and Sediment Technology, may be usable if the investigator determines that the data are reliable and representative of the donor material. Existing data from composited samples may be usable, but this is a deviation from the guidance that requires justification by the investigator with appropriate documentation in the Remedial Action Work Plan and or the Remedial Action Report. If composite sample data are used, you support this decision with additional discrete sample data. Next slide. When new data is needed using this technical guidance, you first develop a sampling and analysis strategy based on the information from the site review, including use of reliable existing data as discussed in the previous slides. Table two is used to establish a sampling frequency for collection of samples from a donor material. Use of Table 2 and reductions in sampling frequencies is similar to what Kathy just presented for alternative fill. Next slide. Next, you need to select the analyses needed. Analyses will usually consist of target compound list organics and target analyte list inorganics. The analyses performed can be modified for all or a subset of samples based on the site review and existing data by adding or subtracting analytes as determined using your review. Other analyses may be needed to ensure geophysical compatibility of receiving ALC and donor material, such as pH or clay content, or to assess other analytes not included in the TCL, TAL, such as dioxins and hexavalent chromium. 
Next slide. The concern with fines, the concern here is with the fines within rock from a commercial quarry or sand from a commercial source, which are expected to be clean, but the only way to show the material is clean is with analytical data. As long as the site review indicates that the source is not impacted by other contaminant sources, one sample per calendar year of operation should be sufficient to show the material is clean. So the sampling frequencies in Table 2 will not apply to these sources. The data for this sample can be provided by the quarry operator as long as the investigator determines the data are reliable. For other sources of rock or sand from undisturbed geologic formations, at least one sample must be analyzed with additional sampling and analysis based on the evaluation of the site review and the initial sample data using Section 6.2 of this guidance. It is possible that one sample may be sufficient from other sources, but the more likely scenario is that additional samples will be needed. Next slide. Natural background. Natural background can be a concern for certain soils or geologic formations that are known to contain naturally occurring elements or compounds that can exceed the department's standards and criteria. Examples include the glauconitic green sand that contains arsenic and igneous rock formations that contain radionuclides. Where radionuclides may be of concern, field screen the donor material to determine whether radiation is found above background levels. Do not use the donor material as clean fill when the field screening indicates that radiation exceeds natural background. There is one ex exception. You can use these materials as clean fill where both the receiving ALC and donor material are from the same geologic material and they have the same background levels. This will be most likely for an on-site source. Next slide. The impact of groundwater evaluation for clean fill is pretty simple. The sample data for the donor material are less than or equal to the default impact of groundwater soil screening levels, then the donor material can be used as clean fill. If the sample data for the donor material are greater than the default IGW soil screening levels, then run the SPLP test on samples selected per the department's impact of groundwater guidance for SPLP use. The SPLP samples should be of the highest contaminant concentrations and representative of the different characteristics of the donor material that would affect mobility of contaminants to groundwater such as pH and soil texture. If the samples pass the SPLP, then the donor material can be used as clean fill. If the samples fail the SPLP, then the donor material cannot be used as clean fill. Again, as Kathy said, that when comparing sample data to the default IGW soil screening levels, the default IGW screening levels for metals with secondary groundwater quality standards such as aluminum or manganese do not apply to this evaluation and can be ignored as stated in the IGW facts on the department's website unless they are from a discharge. Next slide. There are three exclusions that have to be considered in evaluation of the site review and sample data for donor material. One, do not use if asbestos is present from either a natural source or asbestos-containing material. Note that asbestos-containing material less than 1% is no longer considered a reliable indicator of clean material. Two, do not use if the material is recrohazardous. Do recro test if there are any questions that the donor material may be hazardous. And three, do not use material that has dioxins or forans greater than the department's standards or criteria. Next slide. Recycled concrete. Use of recycled concrete as clean fill is subject to this guidance and the department's recycled concrete guidance from the Solid and Hazardous Waste Management Program. As with other existing data, data generated from use of the recycled concrete guidance may be used if it is determined to be equivalent to data that would be generated using the clean fill technical guidance. Because the recycled concrete guidance does not include an impact of groundwater evaluation, you evaluate impact of groundwater using the IGW evaluation in section 6.5 of the clean fill technical guidance. If the recycled concrete 
is determined to be acceptable for use as clean fill, it still requires a certificate of authority to operate beneficial use determination from the department's solid and hazardous waste management program. Last slide, please. Final slide covers sediment. Sediment includes dredge material and processed dredge material. As with soil donor material, sample analyses and the frequency of sampling for sediment donor material are determined based on the site review in Table 2. You may be able to use data, usually composite data, from the Department's Office of Dredging and Sediment Technology, as long as the data are determined to be reliable using this guidance. The appropriate information to make this determination has to be requested from ODST. Additives used to make processed dredge material may be a potential concern, so the bench scale data has to be evaluated from this perspective. Again, the appropriate information for this evaluation has to be requested from ODST. Finally, to use sediment as clean fill, ODST requires the supplier of the sediment to have an acceptable use determination, or AUD, and the receiving site must have a final remedial action work plan. Thank you, and at this time, I will turn it over to Roger Ferguson. You say so, Tessie. Hi, my name is Roger Ferguson. I'm an LSRP. I work for uh, Sadat Association. I was the Sadat Associate, excuse me, and I was the LSRPA's representative uh, on the committee. I have to say a couple of things quick. This was a long and arduous process. At I don't know, if there was any time we ever agreed 100% on anything, but it was in fact a consensus agreement. Um, and I really do need to thank Neil Rivers, uh, Kathleen Murray, and Carrie McGowan for all their help. And Carrie, I, if you're out there listening, I really do hope you're feeling better. Um, and of course, I want to thank my wife, who's had to put up with me ranting and raving about this for about the last year. Which one is it? There we go. Oh. Joe, can you run me back one? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, technical difficulties. We're going to talk a little bit about dis distributions and statistics. I know it's everybody's favorite discussion point after lunch, but it comes into play in what we're talking about. It lends itself into sampling frequencies. From there, we can talk about compliance options, um, the development of a fill use plan, tracking of material, and probably more importantly, pr the use of professional judgment and how we put all of this together. And we've put together a very brief hypothetical example, since nobody's really done this yet, but try to tie everything together as we wrap it up. Next slide. Okay, done with that. 
Statistics. As much as people don't want to remember, any statistics computed about a sample population are really only inferences about the characteristics of the population of the whole, such as the, its location, the spread, the skewness, the variability, what have you. Um, and the variations in the data are really the key issues that this committee fought with for a long period of time. You may remember that if we have a normal distribution, 95% of the population will be represented by two standard deviations about the mean. Okay. We're very concerned about what happens with the outliers. Okay. There are, of course, a number of other types of distributions out there besides normal or Gaussian. Next slide. And again, what do we do with the black swans? How do we identify where the outliers may be? And more importantly, what do we do to try to avoid them? And by all means, please don't drive the school bus blindfolded. Next slide. These are a couple of example distributions. On your right, you'll see a normal distribution, that the classic Gaussian bell curve, where the mean and the median are right in the middle. On the left is a log normal distribution, where you see the mean and the median are, in fact, displaced. OK. Next slide. There are also bimodal distributions where you can see it actually looks like a two-humped camel. Um, and on the right, a non-parametric distribution where, in fact, there is no discernible pattern to the data. And even if we have large numbers of samples on some of our sites, and I'll get into this with a real example later, there is no actual distribution to the data that we can rely upon. And that is something that we have to take into consideration in the development of our sampling plans and the use of the data. Next slide. Some references. If you're really interested in the subject, Gilbert's a tremendous book I keep in my office. Uh, a couple other things. USGS has a very good statistical methods book out, as does EPA. And I highly recommend The Black Swan, the book, not the movie. Next. Sample frequency. In tables one and two of the guidance, which are in fact the same tables, the committee relied upon the existing regulatory structure in the current tech regs, section 6.4, for the soils reuse program, which basically is the old two samples for the first 100 cubic yards and one sample for every 100 cubic yards thereafter. That is the basis of the default sampling protocol. That, that protocol has always said if there is more than 10,000 cubic yards, you can apply for a reduction in the sampling frequency. The reduced sampling frequency in Table 1 and 2 was when we have some information about the facility and we have the ability to do field screening, i.e. we're out there with a photoionization detector or something similar to screen the material at before we collect our samples. It's important to remember that both of these sampling frequencies were based on discrete grab samples as far as the collection strategy. There are as Kathy alluded to, and I think they've mentioned it as well, we can reduce our sampling frequency further based on professional judgment, but this is a deviation from the guidance. You will have to be able to support why you did what you did. Next slide. This is an excerpt from Table 1 and Table 2. Very quickly, the default scheme versus the reduced sampling scheme. And if you want to look across and say we're between 200 to 300 cubic yards, the default scheme where we don't have any information about the material, maybe it's a pile that appeared along the side of the road from a construction project. Linear construction is a big topic now. And you don't have any real information as to what the sources were, then that is probably the appropriate sampling frequency for that material. But if you do have some information about the source of that material and you can field screen it, then you can immediately step back to that reduced sampling scheme. And again, there are ways to go beyond that. Both, okay. Dave and Kathy both mentioned using composite samples. Again, this is a deviation from the guidance. It is, of course, not appropriate for volatile organic samples. I don't think we have to teach people why that's the case anymore. Okay. It would especially be appropriate if you have a stockpile of material, material that's already been excavated, moved, which means there's been a lot of commingling. Stockpiles tend to be more homogeneous than in situ samples. So the, the stock, or the use of composite samples, excuse me, 
is much more appropriate in those situations and is, of course, a way to get to the end result faster. We've included some additional sources on sampling strategies that involve compositing. There's the ITRC incremental sampling methodology, which is still only a draft. It's due soon. The ODST dredging manual discusses compositing. ASTM has several good documents that talk about compositing that you could rely upon. And if you really want to hurt the brain, go read SW846, Chapter 9. It's, it's heavy on the statistics. It hurts. Next, sir. Compliance options. We talk in the guidance about two separate compliance options. The first is the 75th percentile, which, if it wasn't really relayed before, was part of the proposed rule for the technical requirements for site remediation. We are presuming it will still be there in May. In addition, the guidance also discusses the use of the 95th percent upper confidence level of the mean as an alternative to the 75th percentile. Next slide, Jeff. Terry discussed it a little bit, but the objective of the 75th percentile was that rather than increase the characterization effort, site remediation opted to employ a more conservative limit. And believe me, we went around and around and around on this. Okay. It's believed that this would allow the importation of the largest amount of contaminated fill while minimizing the potential of extreme results. Again, those outliers are black swans. Okay. And it's going to, as a result, it's going to provide a margin of safety to prevent concentrations above those that are already on site. A lot of what we talked about was, you know, you're bringing in a mass of material, hundreds of thousands of tons in some cases. How do we know that the aggregate of that hundreds of thousands of tons are not worse than what's already there? Because it's the total mass that you have to worry about in some regard as to whether it will cause an impact. Okay. The 75th percentile does offer certain advantages for certain distribution types. You know, as we showed in some of the slides before, those observations show that there's a central tendency and that the potential outliers are generally above the 75th percentile or below the 25th percentile. We're worried, of course, about the stuff that's above the 75th percentile. Next slide. A brief example comes from some EPA guidance. You can do a quartile plot. There's actually an easier way to do that. I'll get to this. Okay. But as you see on the right, it's that range that's in pinkish on the far left or for the right side of the curve where you see the concentrations start to go up, that's the area that we're concerned about. That's what's over the 75th percentile. I think the box moved just a little bit when the slide was reproduced. We'll fix that. Okay. Next slide, Joe. If you're running Microsoft Excel, I would imagine OpenOffice does the same thing. There is a built-in function that calculates any percentile you want. In the case of the 75th percentile, Using the data set that's in the guidance, you type in percentile, you put the range, comma 0 0.75, and Excel will spit out the 75th percentile. It's interesting to know, in this particular data set, if you calculate the mean, it's 93 milligrams per kilogram. But the 75th percentile is only 32. Okay? That's the effect of that last sample, sample number 8, which a lot of people might call an outlier. Okay? In putting, doing the data crunching for these types of applications, removing outliers is not considered to be appropriate. They're there, they're real, we have to include them in our calculations. Okay? Again, this data is non-parametric. There is no distribution to that particular data set, which is not uncommon. Alternatives. The primary alternative we talked about is the 95th percent upper confidence level. This is actually going to be a variance from the proposed rule. If the 75th percentile is in the proposed tech reg, we're moving away from that. And we're presuming it will be approved as proposed. Next slide. OK. The 95th percent upper confidence level, level is the region about the sample mean that is likely to contain the actual population mean. If we keep sampling it forever or infinitely, all of those samples will be 
or 95% of those samples, excuse me, will be within that range. Or there's a 5% probability that the popula actual population mean will fall outside of that 95th percentile range. So our upper confidence limit then is really an expression of a less than 2.5% chance that any collected sample will be above that number. Okay. This is the basis for doing risk assessments according to EPA guidance. When you're using the RI data set, you calculate the 95th percent upper confidence level to determine a likely worst case scenario. This is, and the committee has agreed that this would be a robust and appropriate way to cal calculate your max. Okay. The sample size is especially important when we're calculating the UCLs and it is possible that you can have a UCL which may actually exceed the maximum sample result that's reported in your data set. That's the way the math works. If you run into something like that, you would have to default back to your sample maximum. Okay? Obviously, in a case like that, maybe it's not obvious, we would recommend that you collect additional samples. But again, if it's a non-parametric data set, you can keep sampling and you still won't necessarily tighten that range up. Okay. Next slide, Jeff. US EPA has published software that's free. One of my favorite words. ProUCL is a tremendous software package uh, available from US EPA. I believe 4.10 is the latest version okay, that will calculate compound by compound by compound the 95th percent upper confidence level. In our guidance, we recommend a minimum of 20 samples if you're going to go down this road. Okay, it, it, it doesn't work well when you're using four or five samples. Again, do not include potential outliers. They, they get modeled in anyway. And one of the advantages of ProUCL is the software actually now handles non-detect data rather than doing the old divide the MDL by one half and plugging it in manually. The software has that capability. Next. ProUCL calculates a goodness of fit test. It determines what distribution the data really is. And it recommends the appropriate upper confidence level from probably 25 to 30 different mathematical formula to calculate the number. In their guidance, they make it very clear the user is the person responsible for selecting the appropriate UCL at the end of the day. You still have to go in and look at the data and make sure it makes sense. Again, if you see a UCL that's over your maximum, you've got to scratch your head a little bit and decide whether you want to use that data. Save and print the outputs of ProUCL. That should be included as part of your documentation for how your variance is, in fact, protective. That's the kind of backup data that would be needed. Go ahead, Joe. We included some actual site characterization data. This is uh, data from a historic fill site here in Trenton. Um, where we collected well over 100 remedial investigation samples uh, in order to characterize the site. And there are some interesting things that pop out here uh, when you look at the numbers in detail. Um, we actually did a risk assessment on this data, so the 95th percent UCL was the original reason why we ran the numbers, but we added in the 75th percentile afterwards. If you look at the PAHs, you know that we did a summation. Oh, sorry. Bottom one goes back? Bring it back. Let Joe bring it back. Thank you. I'll just and then use the bottom one. Well, for the, the okay. Right. Thank you, Tessa. I don't know if it'll work. Yep, that works. There. Okay. If you, and I, you can't see this on the web. If you look at the t benzo B fluoranthine, benzo K fluoranthine, both have the same toxicological endpoint. Therefore, we can use the total of the two as our acceptance criteria. As long as the two don't add up over that, that would be the number that we would be allowed to bring on the site. Okay. But it's interesting to note that there is, for the most part, pretty good agreement in the data set in the numbers allowed. Benzo B fluoranthine has a 75th percentile of 0.75 and a 95th percent UCL of 0.94. We're talking roughly the same number, give or take. Okay. If you look at the number for lead, however, 
Okay, because there was a maximum of over 19,000 parts per million lead on this site, the mean is actually much higher than the 75th percentile, but the 95th percent upper confidence level is much higher than the 75th percentile. Okay, a difference of 304 for the 75th percentile, which is actually less than the residential criteria, so you would default to that number. Whereas if you use the 95th percent upper confidence level, that would tell you that you could import up to almost 1,800 milligrams per kilogram lead as your acceptance criteria. If it wasn't clear in the guidance, what we would say is that you have to pick one methodology or the other. And you have to be aware when you're developing your protocol for what you're going to accept on a site that there are limitations by using either calculation method. But you have to pick one and be consistent with it. Okay. Next slide, Joe. The fill use plan is a current requirement of the tech regs. There was a discussion included as Appendix B of the guidance. You would re prepare and submit a fill use plan as either part of your raw or as part of the remedial action report would be the two logical places. Okay. Note that while it is currently required in the tech regs at 6.4D, it was not defined in the regulation. And the tech regs currently references the 1998 guidance document for the remediation of contaminated soils, which in fact is a circular reference back to the tech regs. So we're, it's one of those things that still has to get cleaned up. Okay? While the f guidance document itself is outdated, there are some really key concepts in there, and as that is, you know, determination of the waste characterization is a requirement, or you know, the import material character. How did you characterize your stuff? Okay, and what was your rationale? These are things that the professional is going to have to be able to document in order to justify their position. Next slide. The fill use plan also includes the requirements, use the term loosely, that we have to identify what the areas of concern were. You should be showing some kind of fill depth cross-section. Maybe this can be done easily verbally, but maybe you need a more sophisticated engineering diagram and you would have to address what engineering controls are necessary and show those as well. You know, the classic raw submission for this is what the cap is going to look like. Other considerations in preparing a fill use plan, there are pinelands restrictions, of course. Okay. Pinelands having the thou shalt not impact groundwater requirement. There is always a concern over objectionable odors and appearances. Okay, what if a truckload of stuff gets dumped, it doesn't smell right? What do you do with it? How are you going to deal with that? It should be something you put in your fill plan. Regulatory compliance. Are we complying with all the appropriate regulations? The solid waste rules have been discussed before, but maybe there are also wetlands rules or other regulations that may be in play, depending on where you're placing fill. And last, allowable storage time. Solid waste rules. And always remember that if you stockpile it for more than six months, you are technically, op technically open to enforcement action for running an illegal solid waste landfill. Okay. Next slide. Tracking and flow of material. Some best management practices. Should always have a weight ticket system. If you're going to use trucks, the volume per truck will vary. So how are you keeping track of how much material you brought on site? Document the gatekeeper's approvals and or permits. Where did the stuff come from? Have some paper record that, yes, I looked at the material from the donor site. Yes, it was acceptable or no, it was not acceptable. And keep those in your file. Okay. If you're working with a large project site, establish some kind of grid system so that you know that on today, October the 21st, if a truck came in, it went over there. Heaven forbid you have to go look for Jimmy Hoffa later. Okay. Soil erosion controls okay, are going to be required if you're disturbing large areas of soil. Dust control, especially if we're dealing with alternate fill and contaminated materials, you know, nuisance dust could be an issue. Okay. And again, there should be a field inspection procedure for those incoming loads. You know, 
We want to make sure that we're getting what we thought we were getting from where we thought we were getting it from. You know, in talking with some of the folks on the committee, there have been experiences that you start moving a lot of soil, trucks just show up, and they tend to just fall in line. And you have to be ever vigilant about that. Again, these are things that you're going to document in the raw and in the remedial action report. Professional judgment. This is an ongoing topic for all practitioners right now, especially because it's so new. The term gatekeeper came about in our guidance very early on. And in fact, it was the deputy commissioner, Mrs. Kropp, who suggested it. Um, it was later removed to be more consistent with other guidance. But we liked it so much, we decided we really wanted to keep it and talk about it here. The LSRP, or in cases where it is a DEP-led, publicly funded project, it may in fact be somebody from DEP, that person is the gatekeeper who is responsible for what comes onto the site. In the case of an LSRP, this means there is personal liability for what you bring in the door. So you have to be responsible for the quality of the material. And, and the term just summed up in a nutshell the concerns that the committee had and the department had so well that, that it bears keeping in mind as you go through this process. Okay. So while the LSRP has responsibility, also remember that underneath all of that in, in the existing law and regulation, the person responsible for conducting the remediation also remains responsible for the property. So if something comes in that shouldn't, you know, th there's two sets of folks who are going to have potential liability. And part of all the process is the idea that you want to set up the control so that you can document that in a good faith effort that another professional would have employed at that time, you did everything you were supposed to do. Some wrap up. We were going to have some flow charts for everybody, but we didn't quite get them finished and it didn't get taken out of the slide. We'll get those done and get those up on the web at some point. I want to talk a little bit about a hypothetical project site because, like I said, nobody's really done this with this guidance yet. So I can't say, yeah, I did this. Here's how we did it. Next slide, Joe. We have a low-lying brownfield site. And fill is required to meet the remedial objectives based on the, I shouldn't say case management, conceptual model. Yeah, how do we, how'd we change that? Okay. <laughs> Looking at my notes going, I didn't write that. Uh, so, okay, conceptual site model. And there's some terrific guidance that's coming out on this subject. And it's really the, you know, what do we know about our site? What are we proposing to do? What are the pathways? And everything gets tied back to that. Okay. We need to backfill areas, specific areas of concern and excavations. We're going to implement engineering controls on this site. And we want to raise the grade up out of the floodplain. You're up in Boundbrook or Manville or Middlesex, where we have issues with flooding. We don't want the floodwaters to degrade our engineering control. So we may want to build it up a little bit more. The use of alternative fill material then would greatly reduce the reliance on clean fill and reduce the cost of the remedy, all the while still being protective. So we're going to take our RI data from our site that we're remediating, and we're going to develop our protective acceptance criteria based on like on like. We'll develop the 75th percentile based on that data, or if you want to go use the 95th percentile as a variance, great. We're going to rely on the existing soil remediation standards guidance, especially the impact of groundwater sections. I think this was one of the other areas where we had a lot of back and forth. And personally, I just said, you know, go back to the impact of groundwater guidance. That's what's in play. If that changes, great. We don't have to rewrite our guidance. Strictly selfishly, of course. Okay. We also want to consider geotechnical considerations. What are the geotechnical properties of the material we're proposing to import? And will they work on our site? And you don't want to put something down as a base material, and it's not appropriate for the building you're going to put on it. 
or whatever the proposed final use is. So that would be something else you need to think through. Then we're going to review our donor site data, both for alternative and clean fill. The clean fill, of course, will be required to finish the cap. So you probably have both that you'll have to deal with. When you're looking at your site review for where the fill material may come from, was that site review data reliable, both in terms of what was the history of the site and the chemical quality and geotechnical quality of the data? Was the sampling protocol adequate? These are questions you want to ask yourself as you're going through this. Okay. Was the data reviewed and is it reliable? Is the data usable? Okay. And then where would the material be used? Some material might only be suitable for subgrade. The impact of material would have to probably be capped, most likely depending on the levels that are present. Would it be approvable for final cover? Was it clean? Or, you know, is there no use at all? Is the material rejected for your site for whatever reason? And again, make sure you have these things documented. Certainly that these are the things you're going to put in the remedial action work plan and or the raw. Okay. That's really it. My contact information, um, I said we'll get this revised. And I think from there we're ready to go to questions and answers. We're going to give about 10 minutes total for questions. Um, you guys want to come up. We'll also take some questions from the web. If we don't get to all of those, we'll try to get uh, responses to those people. Do we have any other hand bill? Or is it just, just the two? Just the two. All right, who has the first question? Nice and loud. Okay. Roger, I'm looking at your slides again. Under sampling frequency, you said that we're using basically the same rate we've always used for the soils, which is two samples for the first 100 cubic yards, one sample for every other 100 cubic yards, et cetera. However, on the following slide, tables one and two, give, let's go with the example you gave us at 200 to 300 cubic yards. It's calling for seven samples. Now, is that collect seven samples, analyze four, or is that collect seven samples, analyze seven samples for only 300 cubic yards? The genesis of the sampling frequency was the existing soils reuse plan. Um, the numbers that are in the tables, if we're talking about seven samples, would be analyze seven samples. If you happen to collect more than that, so be it, but you had the minimum to meet the default criteria, you would have to actually analyze seven samples. Um, there would, of course, be the ability to, if you had more information, which we would expect some people would have, reduce that immediately. But we're, you know, so the basic in that particular, the default frequency would be seven grab samples of the material in question. Other than that, that it, was, it was really our starting place. Okay? And, and understand that that rule is still in the, in, in the tech rule. That soils reuse section is still there. Okay? So we are, in a sense, what we've written is a variance from the existing rule, and we're moving forward from that. We're assuming that it won't be in the, the next generation of the tech rule. All right, the next question is from the web, and we have uh, for process dredge material, do we need to sample from table one even after approval by ODST? Uh, this is really dependent on the judgment of the uh, uh, LSRP or the gatekeeper or the investigator or whoever you want to call. It may be that the, the data you've collected uh, as part of the ODST process is sufficient. Uh, in part, there's a reduced level of uh, effort needed in terms of sampling because the material generally uh, tends to be very, very homogeneous. So the, the amount of discrete samples, if you will, or the composite samples that are required uh, go down quite a bit. Uh, but again, uh, to a certain extent, if you were uh, dredging a, a, a sand bank out in Delaware Bay and you knew it was all the same material, it was all uniform, obviously fewer samples. If, in fact, you're in an industrial area and you're going through a variety of navigational channels, 
maybe you want to up the number. So there's different situations that you're going to have. There, there isn't one answer that you can give with this, and it really is very uh, example specific. More in here? Anybody? Questions? In the back? Hold on. I guess every question is for Roger today. Roger, going back to your last, I'll stand up so you can see me. Going back to your last, uh, last example, you talked about uh, bringing in a lot of alternative fill for brownfield sites. But if we go back to the beginning of the alternative fill section, it mentions that you only can bring enough fill in to complete your remediation. Uh, can you kind of rectify that? I mean, I don't, you know, unless you're telling me that to raise the, the level out of the floodplain is remediation. Raising the level out of the floodplain was something that the legislature uh, put into Sarah um, in their limitation on the amount of fill that can be brought in. Um, I believe that would still be a variance from the rule as currently proposed. And I'll let Terry handle the rest. In order to have your engineering control be effective, we certainly don't want it washing away with the first flood. So as part of the building an appropriate engineering control, you would be allowed to raise it above grade, uh, obviously armoring it protectively to prevent erosion and all this other part of things because you're in a lower elevation subject to flooding. So that would not really be, that would be considered part of building an appropriate cap system. I have a question regarding clean fill and some practical matters for an LSRP. Uh, currently, we've got ongoing projects. We're backfilling excavations. Um, typically, if it's certified from a virgin source on a piece of paper from the guy who dug it up, 